How do you start a Grand Budapest hotel? How do you start it up? I'm interested. Some harpsichord. And, <laughs> and like, a, like a mandolin with like someone strumming very rapidly, Ooh. tremolo. Like... <laughs> That's exactly. I love this. Yeah. I love this movie. Hello, everybody. Hello, chaps. Hi. In podcast land and also on YouTube. Today, we're talking about the greatest commercial success of Wes Anderson's career, I think. Is it? Yep. But there it's not it particularly big success. 190 million worldwide, something like that. I don't look that stuff up because I don't care about money. I care about the <laughs> real stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the takeaways. The hero's journey <laughs> stuff. This is Grand Budapest Hotel, Wes Anderson's movie. And boy, Wes Anderson's movie. It's his movie. It's his movie. He, he, he worked hard on he, it. He's all over it. He clearly worked hard on his it. His fingerprints are everywhere in it, which is true because he's he takes the o o tour a tour. Yeah, what makes approach? an o, what makes a director an o tour director? Just how good they are? No, I think it's like how involved they are in every single aspect of production. It's right. like he he wrote the thing, he directed it, he's part of the production design. I read that. Those little newspapers that show up. He wrote those articles. He write, he writes all the articles yeah. in the newspapers. He like gives the production designer specific color palettes. Palettes. I think it goes beyond that. It's not even about doing it yourself. It's about having a clear enough vision that the supporting staff can engage with that vision. And then it has a unified single voice, which is the auteur's right. voice. Right. right. Because I'm kind of thinking, like, obviously, someone like Tarantino or Kubrick, they're auteurs. Mm -hmm but is Denis Villeneuve. Because I don't think he's as involved as you're describing Wes Anderson being involved in this movie. If you think of a project like Blade Runner 2049, though, he involved so many people that he trusted, and they all worked together in this uh, unified way. It's it's hard. I mean, he his movies aren't as instantly recognizable as someone like Wes Anderson, where you look at one frame and you're like, yeah, that's a Wes Anderson movie. Yeah. Uh, but there's certainly a voice or a feeling or something to a Denis Villeneuve movie that is authentically himself. And I think that I would call him an auteur for that reason. And all these all these directors are kind of like, you know, offshoots of the original auteur, George Lucas. I thought you were say, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> George Lucas, the original auteur. Get out of here, man. Like Wes Anderson, though, his movies have such a distinct style that, and it's shared between most of them. Although we can get into the variation later on. But it's almost like coming home. It's mm. almost like comfort. Like you turn it on and you're just like, ah, I'm back. If you if you like Wes Anderson, you're like, yeah, yeah we're back in Wes Anderson's mind. I kind of get that. I kind of get what you're saying there. But for me, it's almost like going to, instead of going home, it's like going to my grandparents' house. Because everything's like kind of, there's, there's muted browns and yellows and kind of like. It's quaint AF. Yeah, yeah. Very quaint. Very kind of like old upholstery sort of feel. And whimsy. Lots of whimsy. Oh, whimsy. Whimsy up the yin yang. But also melancholy. Dang, dude. You're coming out with these abje well, adjectives. I like it's them. like, how would you describe his movies? They're not like dramas. They're not comedies. They're half tragedy, half comedy. And he kind of has this weird tone that no one else is going They're for. They're tragedies. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Dramagedy. <laughs> Your majesty. Co Comagedies. Yeah. Yeah. They, Curmudgeons. They, have, they all have comedic elements to them, and they're all kind of dramas a lot of them are family dramas but they have this lightness to them and levity mm. but there is usually a character who's depressed or like for sure like even in tenenbaums there's a depressed character and another character who's suicidal yeah and look at uh, life aquatic bill murray is pretty depressive in that movie and that's one of the funny that's one of the funny things about this movie to me is that there aren't a ton of characters in it who are who have that like darkness in them but the environment does. Yes. The, the hotel has mm -hmm. this sort of like glorious past and it has now sunken into decay. There's fascism, the threat of fascism. Yeah, so you're getting into the themes now. But before yeah. we dive too deep, let's just talk about what we think of this movie overall. <laughs> David, hit me with your slogan and your recommendation about this movie. Grand Budapest is the ultimate confection. Immaculate presentation, sweet enough for even the most sugar-fixed jonesing, while balanced with enough substance to offer a never-ending satisfaction that I can never stop stuffing into my brain. Definite watch. Okay. Wow. Available for two for one at Mendel's. Okay, wait. We got rid of the ratings, but now I'm taking issue with the length of your slogans. That's not that long. That one's three You're writing lines. like a little paragraph. That's three lines. Three lines doesn't make a paragraph. I'll extend the margin to you, then I'm gonna call two the, lines. I'm going to call the podcast police. The po <laughs> this is... Something like the vegan Yeah, rein it in, David. Okay, Grand Budapest is good. <laughs> Thank you. He gives a, now a, a that's definite a watch. Slogan. It's a definite watch. Definite I, want, watch. I want stuff like that on every movie poster. Good. Watch this one. It's good. <laughs> I keep I make them so long because I imagine like uh, one day when my dreams come true and I'm a Rotten Tomato approved critic, 
Uh, my little tagline will be these slogans, and I want them to be so clever, oh so my good. Gosh. Yeah, everyone was gonna be like David. Oh, that's the guy with the real good slogans. I transcribed them all. I <laughs> bought his book of just slogans. The whole book is slogans. All right, my slogan is not as good as David's, and that's the real reason I'm attacking you. It never is because I just feel inadequate. Watch this movie if you have a longing for a more sophisticated time at the height of confectionery sophistication, and when life happened in a four by three aspect ratio. That's it. So that's a recommended movie. You- yeah, watch this movie. Not a definite. Because what are the ra- what we have? Don't watch, watch, watch with asterisks, and, and definitely watch, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was gonna say maybe watch, but yeah. like I definitely you should watch this movie, but it's not like a must see. You know what? <laughs> I'm so confused. I'm having a hard time with this new system. I want numbers again. A lot of people miss the numbers. Uh, if you really hate that we're not doing the numbers, tell us in the comments. If you want the numbers back, but if we bring the numbers back, you no can't, babies. Yeah, you can't complain. That's you can't what you get. Like, <laughs> you can't make that sound. None of that. Anyways, James Grand Budapest Hotel makes you want to get a room and watch all of Wes Anderson's other films that you never had the chance to check out. <laughs> oh, ting ting. There's the pun. There's two. So get, if a, I, get a room. Yeah. Okay. There's two in there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But there's definitely one at the end. Yep. I'm giving this movie a recommendation. You should watch it. I'm not saying you got to watch this movie before you die. Don't definitely watch, but a strong recommendation. Very good. If there's a woman in the room or a family, you know, there's a little bit of violence in this movie, but I think if you have like 14-year-olds up to 80-year-olds in the room, you can throw this on and everyone will be happy. Oh, yeah. Well, there's not. What, what, where's the violence? There's some fingers chopped off. Oh, yeah, yeah, and some bloody noses and stuff. Yeah. But see, see why I think I, this is a definite watch for me is that it's so short. It is such a pleasant watch. It's hour 40 with the credits. So it was like an hour 30. Tight 90. Oh, it moves. And like, I think almost anybody, even if you're a pretty cynical person, can watch this movie and like get through it and like really enjoy it. Yeah. No, I loved it. And then she's like, why do they talk so f- flowery? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the words big. But I think even, <laughs> I think even for those people... We will we'll get into this, but there's moments where they cut through that with some like modern speech yep. and with uh, rudeness and vulgarity that kind of like cuts through that stuff and like makes it funny. Certainly, there's an awareness about uh, Ray Freen's character in particular who has that flowery speech, but everyone else isn't quite on the same level as him, and they they address that he's kind of a, of a different era. For those of you who haven't seen this movie, Riley's gonna sum it up for you. It is the present day. A girl visits a monument to a great author. It is 1985. That same author begins telling the story of a summer he spent at a once great establishment in the fictional European country of Zabrovka. It is 1968. The young version of the author meets the owner of the hotel who tells him the story of how he came to own it. It is 1932. Monsieur Gustave is the concierge of the highly esteemed Grand Budapest Hotel who becomes embroiled in a farcical scandal when one of his oldest and richest patrons turns up dead suspiciously leaving him her most priceless work of art. When the woman's son challenges the will, Gustav's protege Zero must clear his name and find the real killer. That's it. Look, I need to work on these synopses. No, that was great. That David, was, you're giving I me a look. That had everything I wanted. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. Now I know well, what happened in this The movie. only thing you didn't say is that Gustav's protege Zero is the person telling the story to the author. That's right. That's right. Well, didn't get there. It's okay. It was a bit. This is a hard synopsis to write because I I didn't know whether to include the fact that this movie is nested within four different timelines. Oh, that's this, important and actually super cool. I want to talk about that right after this message from our sponsors. Okay, Manscaped, the best in below the belt grooming, and I can contest now that I have personally shaved my balls with Lawnmower 3.0. <laughs> um, Wow, I didn't realize I had trauma from my past razor where I was like super careful all the time because I've been bitten in the past. But this thing, (laughs) the guard, you can be so cavalier. You can just go ham. You can do this in the dark drunk. It doesn't matter. Because there's a light on it. Smash that hair off your crotch. Get it out of there. (laughs) This thing has a ceramic blade, a 7,000 RPM quiet stroke motor. And I really mean quiet. It's way quieter than my last razor. And as Riley alluded, an LED light so you can see what you're doing. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code carpool at manscaped.com. The more of you guys buy it, the more money we make. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, We're also brought to you by Private Internet Access VPN, the one that I use today to help me hide my true IP address and allowed me, you know, to bypass those geo restrictions and censorship that I hate. You can connect <laughs> up to five devices at once, and it includes an internet kill switch if your VPN gets disconnected involuntarily. What's that sound like, Riley? Exactly. PIA is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and even as a Chrome extension. So check it out at lmg.gg slash carpoolpia. Did that sound like a gun? Yeah, like a child making a yeah, gun yeah, noise. Yeah, it was like, a, it was like, like a, a 60s TV show gun. You feel so cool when you're a kid and you do that noise. If I was playing with you and I threw you an imaginary gun and you shot it like that, I'd be like, Pfft. No. The gun I threw you no, was way better than that's that. That's a precision. That's a silenced submachine gun. Sounds like a kind of wimp. It's not like a magnum, like. <laughs> it's not like a thump. <laughs> that thump was weak, man. That's a pretty good thump. Thump. Jeez, dude. You need more resonance in the thump. 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 Just shooting bubbles <laughs> underwater. Thump. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie is a movie within a movie within a movie. Within a movie. It's the inception of storytelling Not really. movies. Oh, that's deep, dude. So we open on a girl standing outside of the st a statue. The statue is just marked author. Yes. And she there's a bunch of keys hanging on it. So even this, I don't know why there's keys hanging on this statue. Because the society of the locked key or the cross keys. Oh. oh. Whoa, but he's not a concierge. But I think he's probably most well known for the story. And so yeah. they, they is that what the book is called? The, Grand no. the book is called The Grand Budapest Hotel. Yeah, okay. I think what, pro what probably happened is that he wrote this book called The Grand Budapest Hotel, and it was such a tribute to this former time that all of these concierges came and left their keys on the on the That monument. is deep world building. Oh, totally. Yeah. That is cool. That's I, Wes Anderson. Well, because you think about if you read a book that an author wrote, you wouldn't be like, oh, I want to go find like Mus Zero Mustafa's grave or Gustav's grave and go and put this thing. You'd be like, oh, this author came up with the story and did all this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a girl standing outside of this thing, yeah. the statue with world building wrapped around it. She's holding a book called The Grand Budapest Hotel. And then she starts... I guess we hear the voiceover of the writer. She's basically right. reading it. We're going to read the story that she's holding. So then it cuts to like 1985, and we see Falcone from Batman Begins. Tom Wilkinson. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get like the first, like, um, the first Wes Anderson moment. He starts reading the story and explaining how this story was told to him by somebody else, and he's just doing his best to recount it. And then in the middle of telling us this, a kid runs in the room and just goes, and just starts <laughs> shooting with a BB gun. And he's just like, ah, ah. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. And that's not, ex there's no explanation. It's it is so what good. it is. What you see is it. A kid ran in and shot at him while he was trying to do something serious. That that moment like encapsulates what is so great about Wes Anderson to me. It's like this air of sophistication, this like, this serious seeming moment where we're kind of like being led and he's like, let me, let me draw you into this story I'm about to tell. And then boom, we just get drawn out and this kid is shooting him from offside, from, from off the side of the, of the shot. And it's just like. It's so funny and it also feels real. Yeah. Like it feels like this is we're just in this guy's house and he's got there are these wild kids running around and that's just where we happen to be. And then he resumes uh, his monologue with the kid like sitting on his knee. Yeah. No, no, no. The kid the kid comes up behind him and puts his hand on his shoulder and he says sorry and he's like don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> he sa he says it's okay or something. But he stays in the shot yeah. and then they yeah. do it together. And then the, so the, like that whole time the camera is like doing this like and this is the other funny thing about Wes Anderson. He doesn't really do like a slow zoom ever. No. It's always a, a stages of like zooming in, like zoom in, like tiered. and then stop, and then zoom in, and then stop. Same with his moves. There's very rarely like smooth moves. It's very much 90 degrees one way, 90 degrees back, right. or something like he that. He usually doesn't move it if he can help it. It's usually like staying still, or like you said, it does whips or uh, tracks. Sometimes it'll be in one spot, a way to beat, then the characters move so it tracks with them, and yeah. then it stops again. Very minimal movement. Let's keep nesting here. So that guy's telling the story about when he was younger and he received the story. So then we go a further level down, which is in the 30s. No, no, that's no, no. The 60s. That's the 60s. That's yeah. the 60s. And he's talking to this dude named Zero who's older. Right. He's the owner of the Grand well, he Budapest Hotel. He doesn't know his name Zero yet. Right. We just know he's the owner he's of the Grand Budapest Hotel. Mr. Mustafa. Yeah. A mysterious man whose loneliness matches his own. I like that whole picture when you're like brought into this hotel and it's just like everyone's lonely. Everyone just kept to themselves. You know, the the hotel is full of people, but none of them interact. It's not full of people, but there are people in the hotel. And it's just like 
represents that like it used to be this busy crazy lively place and now people are just kind of like standing at the vending machine trying to get only a certain type of person goes there now and it's kind of like descended into shabbiness um but then okay so then mustafa's telling his story from like 30 years prior yes and then that's 1932 that's 1932 in this fictional country and this this is kind of what i love about this movie is that it's clearly inspired by you know Eastern Europe or, or, or Central Europe and uh, ha- as it was kind of as the rise of all these fascist movements started started popping up. But before we get really into that, let's just stay on this like nesting sequence because there's this aspect ratio thing going on. Did you see that? Yes. So that's what be- I alluded to in my slogan. I didn't really know like I started playing this movie back and then there's this thing that comes on at the beginning that's like set your set to 16 by 9 resolution. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. Did you have that in your copy? Nope. Other people have. I know it's. Not, it wasn't just me. I streamed it. Okay. So, <laughs> what did you put? Pop in a Blu-ray? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was on Plex. It was on. I don't know how it came onto my friend's Plex. I'm on a Plex share. It's my friend. Oh, okay. He has the Blu-ray. Okay. Gotcha. So it tells you to put it in 16 by nine. I thought, okay, this is is this intentional? Is this really part of the movie? What is this? But then when the movie begins, you are in 185. Is that what it is? Yeah. I was trying to look up what the actual ratios are, and I just trusted yeah. that David would know. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah, 1.85 is basically 16 by 9. Okay, yeah. so we start so it's at like 16 It's like the most modern f- format. In modern day, we start in 16 by 9. Yeah, so it's it's signaling to the viewer, you're in the present, right. basically, right? So it keeps that aspect ratio when we are looking at, uh, we're in the 80s in front of the statue, and when we're in 1985... Um, with uh, Falcone and <laughs> Tom Wilkinson, <laughs> yeah, the unnamed and, author. He doesn't. He doesn't have a, a name in this movie, which is kind of funny. And the thing that's maybe interesting is like, okay, we're using one point eight five. Does is that a reference to the year nineteen eighty five? Are they? Is that why he said? I don't 19- think so. That's, okay, you you don't think so? It sounds like it's reaching. So. But wait a second. Oh, I'm going to bring this up. And there's a, a theory. Wait one minute, <laughs> and then you might think it's more realistic. Just, just shut up. Okay, then you go a level down into the <laughs> 60s, right? And then the aspect ratio there is uh, basically 21 by 9, like the wide widescreen ratio. Anamorphic. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2.35 to 1. Um, so there's 2.37 to 1 there. They're all kind of the same. That and, and so that one was standardized in 1957, which is around the period that these p- characters are talking in. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then when you get to the actual story in the, in the 30s with Gustav, that takes place in 1932. Uh, that is the year that the academy ratio was formally established. Uh, and that's like the, um, f- is it four by three? Yep. Okay. Oh, interesting. That's so, funny. I wonder if that was on purpose. Exactly. Oh. 1932 was the year they established that format, that aspect ratio. And it so, was three by two. Whoa. No, it wasn't. It's four by three. <laughs> <laughs> so if that was, that's definitely, that really seems intentional. So then it makes me think back to that. 1985 thing and think eh, maybe that's not so far-fetched maybe i think it's more for like a thematic reason like certainly it's just like there's different storytellers telling these stories so it matters more but, but i always took it as so the author is the best storyteller so he's giving you the most cinematic aspect ratio whereas really? mustafa maybe isn't the best storyteller so he's giving you the four by three what? which is kind of the more classic style uh on top of that four by three is what most classic movies are in so it's trying to evoke a classic feeling so i don't want to bash sure. on your idea but i think it's just to evoke the periods that those aspect ratios were popular in i think all these things can exi- i don't know we can't we don't know what it's West- ever it's both and let's call west yeah i think what this, i think what this movie is actually about is aspect ratios i think that <laughs> west he before this movie was made he was on record saying he wanted to shoot in four by three he wanted to shoot that way so it's cool that he he found like a, a narrative, like a reason. It's not just like like the movie The Lighthouse that came out uh, in 2019. That movie is four is four by three, but it's like there's no real like canonical reason. There's no narrative reason. It just is, and it, right. and it fits the aesthetic of that movie. It's one thing to just do a technical thing for the sake of doing it, and right. it's another thing to like create a reason uh, and make some harmony where like. Everything is working together, and that, that's what Wes Anderson did in in, in this. It's like he ju- maybe he just wanted to shoot in four by three, but he also found like these reasons uh, that that kind of make you think, yeah, this totally fits actually. I it's harmonious it, because it's like they're looking in the past, and this is a, a frame like an aspect ratio from the past. That's cool. I think it really does fit with this movie in particular because Wes Anderson does this kind of thing in a lot of his movies, but I think it works really well with this movie in particular because there are so many characters. Well. 
the main character, Gustav, his whole thing is attention to detail, right? And and every aspect of this production was just like meticulously attended to. And uh, I, it just it just helps the whole feeling. Totally. One thing I love too about that nesting is that the aspect ratio is telling you kind of we're changing stories, we're changing like eras, but they also changed the lighting and the color per era. And the, mm. the most modern one, it's very natural lighting. They don't enhance colors. It's everyone thinks very neutral. And then we go one layer in and it's very 60s. It's very brown and orange. Uh, but it's a little more saturated, and then you go one more layer in, and it's full color. Like, the first thing you see is, like, pink, yeah. red, purple. And right. it's layers of abstraction from truth, because yeah. it's a telephone game, right? Yeah. So the characters are getting more and more unrealistic. Like, it's a pretty... It fits Wes's style to be, like, whimsical and, and weird. Yeah. And it's like, these people aren't real people. But because we're in the past, like, we're accepting it now, yeah. because it's just a story. Oh, I love I love that this movie has such a storybook quality. Like it, it is inspired by and grounded in our actual history of like Eastern Europe and Nazis and stuff. But it has such this like otherworldly feel, so the characters almost feel like mythical. Yeah. Like you know that this is based on real stuff, but but you can watch it and just be taken away to this like fantastic. Yeah, and I think it. he needed to do that because otherwise, if this was like this takes place in Slovenia. Or yeah. like in a real place, not fictionalized. And then later, when like the fascists inhabit the Budapest, the Grand Budapest Hotel, when they put their their drapery in there, and it's just like SS logos, it you could not make it funny. And Wes right. Anderson's movies are funny. So like when when they're just like uh, dramatized, stylized versions of things that we recognize as oh, those obviously the fascists. It looks like Nazi stuff, but it's not. Yeah. Then he still gets a pass on making like totally. a lighthearted movie. And I think it also allows him to take some creative freedoms where if it was actual Nazis and the actual SS, people would be like, well, no, it didn't happen that way. It would be like this and these yeah. papers are this way and that. And like it allows him to just tell the story he wants to tell with full freedom. Totally. He also, I think he uses fictionalized settings quite a bit, right? Like uh, Moonrise Kingdom, I think, was was like in a fictionalized version of New England. So I think he will... I think he will. It, it allows you a lot of creative freedom to just can be like, okay, I want to make a movie set here, but I'm just going to make it into something like that because then I can do whatever. I well, want. Well, yeah, his movies are f- are exercises in world building, but in the subtle way we kind of talked about it in Pulp Fiction a bit, where it's not space, it's not monsters, it's our world, but some yeah. creative interpretation of it. This movie would have been way better with monsters. Oh, I but, love it. Well, I mean, you know, the Nazis okay. could be monsters, but yeah, I think this is his best movie. And will remain his best movie because his style and the story merge perfectly. It's uh, sometimes I find in his movies his style gets in the way of the story he's trying to tell. Like it kind of is one layer of abstraction uh, from the emotional center of what the characters are going through. But because it's about people telling the story, because it's about remembering the past, that style of getting us one layer away from the people really works for creating this world and getting you emotionally engaged. And mm. I find this is the most emotionally engaging Wes Anderson movie uh, really? of all of them. Oh, absolutely. Emotionally engaging? Yeah, I don't find his movies particularly engaging. I think, like, broadly, I like Wes Anderson and I like all his movies, but this is the only one other than Fantastic Mr. Fox that I love. See, yeah. that's, so, that's so funny because one of the notes I wrote down is that I wasn't as emotionally engaged in this one as I feel like I normally am in... Wes Anderson movies. I feel like Ray Fine's character is he's kind of the protagonist, right? Or Zero could be, I guess. I think it's Ray Fine's character. I yeah. think it's Gustav. The story is about Gustav. For sure. Um and I don't think we really managed to get inside his head enough for me to really emotionally connect with him. I think there's that one scene where Zero it kind of comes out of nowhere actually and I kind of like that. Zero uh says he never told me where he came from. He never told me where what happened to his family, you know? And that brought up a bunch of questions for me, and it it added to his characterization because you're like, "Oh, maybe there's some tragic story, you know, the that that made him this the way that he is." But we never learn that story, and we never really know whether he has a tragic backstory or not. We just know that he's this kind of quirky character who cares a lot about, you know, sophistication except when he doesn't. And um, I, I wasn't able to connect with them on that level. Where it, whereas in like the Royal Tenenbaums or Life Aquatic, you have these like deeply damaged characters and you know why they're damaged and you know what they have to do in order to be less damaged. So I feel like there's that journey there and I can kind of like attach myself to that. I guess for me, uh, where I feel like I'm emotionally engaged is actually more in the storyteller's perspective. Mm. So in Royal Tenenbaums, 
uh, it's got a very similar style where you're one step removed. You never get like a really intimate close up of people, even when uh, spoilers for Royal Tenenbaums, Tenenbaums. You never get like when he gives the slicing of his wrist. Yeah. There's no like really intimate close up. It's a medium shot. Uh, you get like the symmetrical shots, and he never gives you like what another filmmaker would give you the extreme close ups. Like, right. He's really like like moving shots, uh, and I find it works for that movie because that's part of the style and it's okay. Hmm. But in this movie. Where I find it emotionally engaged is actually in Mustafa's retelling of the story. And because of that perspective, uh, this separate uh, style where it keeps you removed from like the experience of the characters. Uh, when he's crying, talking about Agatha, or he like has that moment at the end where like the lights go dim and he's just kind of like sad that it's all over. That's what gets me. That's what's so that's so funny. It did not that didn't get me at all. I was kind of like, I'm so removed from this. Because this is a story within a story within a story. I know that. Mustafa in this moment, he's not the main character of the story. He's just getting up emotional thinking about the story that we're actually being told. Man, the more you guys talk, the more I'm starting to think the hotel is the main character. <laughs> well, it is. The it's the same title hotel as The, the Shining. <laughs> this is the Overlook. The Overlook this Hotel is, is back. This, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the, the Overlook was before it was the Overlook. Actually, the could maybe in the oh. like canon of it, it could be like the prequel, and then The Shining happens after oh, once dang. it's abandoned. We no, the Overlook's in America. <laughs> Kubrick was there's no was, funicular. <laughs> Kubrick was haunting Wes Anderson's mind. He was channeling that. the spirit of Kubrick. Well, we talked briefly a little bit about Ray Fiennes. Let's talk about okay, him some more. Okay. Ray Fiennes also. First thing. Ray Fiennes? Fiennes? His Fiennes? name is spelled Ralph. Yeah. I know. Same. I wrote in my notes Rafe, and I was like, oh, I'm wrong. No, it is Rafe. But it's spelled Ralph. But, but it's spelled Ralph. Dude, it's Ray, and his last name starts with an F, and that's why it sounds like Rafe. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm making that up. Oh, are people calling him Ray Fiennes? I hope so. I, I think his, Rafe is a good sci-fi name. Rafe. That, if I was like writing like a sweet badass sci-fi character, I'd call him Rafe. <laughs> that is pretty. Do we badass. need to look this up? It's definitely Rafe. It's spelled Ralph, so I you know can look it up we, if you want. It's got to be Irish or something. Okay, that's not important. What is important is how friggin' charming he is in this movie. Oh my goodness, he is so good. And like this movie really makes me appreciate his range because this guy's been like he's Voldemort a, man. He's been Voldemort. He was a Nazi. He was like a constant s- gardener, a serial killer, like. But he is so likable in this movie, mm. like beyond likable. But yeah. he's, like he gives you so much. He gives you warmth and like love. But he also gives you like funny, like charisma. But he also gives you like those crazy moments when he cracks and he shows his like his frustration. Yeah, so funny. He is impeccable. What do you think is the best part? Like I think it's when he's uh, he's saying like he's confronted by the cops and then he just books it. <laughs> he says he says. He says, she's been murdered, and you think I did it. And then he just turns on his heel and starts running away. And Edward Norton's character, Henkels, is like, what? Stop! Yeah. Oh, I love when he's in the prison, and he's like, he's all beat up. And he's telling, like, oh, like I got into a fight with Pinky, but we're, friend- we're dear friends now. But you should never be a candy ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We're like, I think one of my other favorite moments is uh, the confession booth. And Dominic Green's character, no, that's not, that's the character in Bond. Matthew Almerich's character. And Matthew Almerich's like, ah, oh, there's another will, but it's gone. <laughs> but I made a copy of it. And he's like, yes, there's and a the copy. Time, yeah. And there's this. And he keeps escalating. And then at one point he just breaks and he like has a little fit. Oh, kills like, me. What is it? That yeah. I love that scene so much. He's like, yes. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so good. Um, the, the comedy of Ray Fiennes in this movie, it's hard to express how much I, I love it because like, it's it's that quaint kind of comedy that doesn't make you like roll on the floor laughing, but it's just it's just executed so perfectly. You just get like a it's like a little uh, it's like a little snack every time. You know what it is? You you like silently laugh, like you fall over to the side on your couch laughing yeah. silently, and, and you it, fall into your significant other, and you just and the both of you just kind of like yeah. going <laughs> yeah, and then we, you just share a moment. <laughs> You're just like, oh, isn't he just so? <laughs> oh my gosh! I for one laughed that's out loud. You. That's you. Um, no, I, but, I, I chuckled. But yeah, one thing I love about the humor in this movie is that it always serves a second purpose. Like there are these jokes, but they're never throwaway moments. Like there's always characterization. Like I love the moment when Zero's painting the mustache and he just does a terrible job, and it's like kind of gives you a little bit of an insight yeah. to him. Or like Willem Dafoe's character has uh, Jeff Goldblum's character's cat in his arm. And Jeff Goldblum won't do what he wants, and he just throws it out the window. Did you my cat. <laughs> that's amazing. I think that's the. I think that's the moment in the film where it really like endears itself to me. Like that's the moment where I'm like, this is a good movie. You know, because it's just it's so random. Yeah. Like Adrian Adrian Brody's like agreed, and uh, 
Jeff, Jeff Goldblum's character is like, no, Dimitri, not agreed yeah. or whatever. And then he like gets up. Adrian Brody's character gets up and storms out. <laughs> Yeah, and Willem Dafoe is just like, Whoosh, did you just throw that uh, cat out the window? Those characters really um, exemplify the language, the use of language and flowery language in this movie. Because Adrian Brody's like the, one of the standout characters who doesn't speak with any kind of no b- bombasticness. It's bombasticitude. Th- <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> He's just like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. That I'm gonna funny. blast your candy ass back yeah. to whatever. <laughs> oh, I love that scene. And then he punches Ray Fiends, and then Zero looks for a second, punches him. Then Willem Dafoe punches Zero. Yeah. <laughs> oh, such a good escalation. What What is it about this movie that makes it okay that everyone just talks in their own accent? Like Sir Ronan is Irish. Ray Fiennes is British. Uh, Tony Revolori or whatever his name is, Zero is uh, just American. Adrian Brody's American. It's just like ever. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it doesn't matter. Bill Murray's in it, just being yeah. Bill Murray. I think part of it is that it's they're all from different places. Like Zero's an immigrant. Saoirse Ronan's character is an immigrant from Ireland. Yeah, and they address some of them, but I also think that because they are very clear from the beginning that. These accents are coming from everywhere. Right. You just turn off that part and of your brain. And they've cares. established that they're fictional places. Right. So That's like, true. Well, and they, they're, they wouldn't be speaking English. They'd be speaking whatever language they would, like German or something. Yeah. Which is funny because they lapse into German at certain points, like to be to be fancy about it. Yeah. But I think that is part of like the storybook quality of this, where it's like you just you just suspend your disbelief. And especially with Wes Anderson films like this, where there are like wide shots that are clearly miniatures and they don't even try to make it look real at all. It's like, it's just, this is just a it's miniature. It's so heavily stylized yeah, that yeah. it just looks like you're in a painting. Yeah. So you just forgive that kind of stuff. Or like a, when there's a but silhouette it, running in the background and it's like at a different frame rate, like it's, yeah, it's, it's stop like motion. A yeah. I love those stuff. It's though. so like, charming though. Yeah. When there's like, they're escaping the prison and you just see the feet dangling and it's like not actually just normal feet. It's like something like stop motion-y about it. Yeah. Uh, or like the skiing sequence. Uh, oh yeah! When it's yeah. like it's like miniatures that are going down the hill, and like I love that. And then they it cut. was so frenetic though. Yeah, and it's so it's fast. so weird. And or when they're charming. carrying that ladder, when they're oh, escaping yeah. prison, and that ladder just goes by the screen <laughs> for like yeah. fifteen seconds. Oh, Why I is this it. ladder so long? Yeah, I love it. It's great. Um, the thing I was gonna say about the comedy earlier is that I love how it. So much of the comedy comes from cutting through this air of of poise and sophistication. They just like cut through it with like some vulgarity or a swear word or something after after they get stopped in the train by the soldiers and they have that little altercation and then Gustav saves zero from being taken outside or whatever and he's like see there is, there are some shreds of humanity left in this you know world and it is our humble job to build it. and then he just like stops in the middle he's like ah oh, fucking <laughs> yeah that's actually to me that's like his whole character yeah. arc and that's like the whole theme of the movie right is like this is this movie is like a love letter to the past in that mm. era yep. where like there's just it's just more civilized right like the concierge is, is just the the most shining example of it like here's a guy his whole his whole like being is things that are not animalistic uh it's like to me when someone grows up like you kind of your brain goes through like all the stages of every other animal in a kind right. of a way you know what i mean like when you're a little baby you're just you're just an animal like you're just a pet like i have a baby <laughs> like she, yeah at some part, I, at some point, I see her kind of surpass the dog in certain faculties. Right. And then even, but even you're an animal she's, when you're in high school, man. She's not civilized. Like, We're not civilized in high school. No. Yeah. Like all you want to do is screw people. Yeah. And like you're reactionary, you're active, emotional. Um, yeah, totally emotionally reactive. Instinctual. But then at some point, you have to be like, okay, that guy's really making me mad, but I'm just gonna be silent here and I'm just gonna breathe through that. Yeah. But yeah. but he's from an era, Gustav, where they took that to the next level right right but then you, sometimes you see him break and mm-hmm. th- and that's like that in that moment was just ah oh, fuck it because it takes effort right it takes effort for him to to put on these extra layers of of civil like being civilized right mm-hmm. and when he sees other people being civilized that's when he breaks his like i'm the boss kind of mold actually no i guess it's kind of um in line with that he, he goes very good if someone does something yes if someone someone does the same thing he's doing he's like that's the way to live that's the right way to act what you're doing now it takes effort 100%. And, and he rewards it by saying very good but his arc and 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 the movie is a tragedy because he can't fight this right he, he tries to we we know that the era ends we know that the fascists come and then the hotel just decays and it's all over and then today 
we're slobs. We're not civilized. Yeah. We're watching this movie and go, oh, ho, look how funny they were. But <laughs> we're, we're no, have those little tiny wine glasses. Yeah. It's over and he loses. Well, they do such a good job of exemplifying that with Gustav, that like this, this like artificial civility uh, when he escapes the prison and Zero's there and he's like, oh, well, did you bring the change of clothes? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, did you get a safe house? Oh, no, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Did you bring my cologne? No, sorry. And he freaks out at that. Yeah, and yeah. it's just like, I love that, that there's this artificial level of civility that he, he, he holds dear, but really it's like what's kind of... Well, I don't want to say it's artificial. I is when, when James was going through that whole thing, I was like, yes, 100%, I'm down with this because I really... I, that's what I connect with is that as, you know, we are animals. and But the thing that makes us different from animals is the fact that we are civilized, that we choose to willingly cooperate you know not and not so just so that we can you know get something that is useful to us but so that it benefits society as a whole and there or, are these, or you like choose to be a vegetarian even right. though you know that meat's good for you yeah you're like and you're gonna have to do more extra work to to get the proteins and stuff that you need that that you could otherwise get by just eating chicken or beef like or you everybody choose else to be monogamous yeah exactly yeah there's a, just a lot of aspects of civilization that i think make us better and i think that his character knows that and so he he truly believes that human life is better when you are more civilized. That's fair. So he he keeps trying to get to that place, and he and he fails, right? Just like we all fail, we all make mistakes all the time. And in that moment when he doesn't have his perfume, he freaks out. But then after that, he says, "Oh, that was wrong. I apologize." It's oh, he catches himself, yeah. right? Because he he's like the perfume is the one thing that is the most civilized here that yeah. I need the most. But then he blows up, and then he forgets. No, the right. spirit of Christmas really the spirit is, is, <laughs> is that yeah. I shouldn't blow up like that. I right. should. I should contain my emotions you are my dear friend and protege and i'm very proud of you that's fair and 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 he does go out hold upholding that value like he dies because he is upholding this value of like civilization and goodness through uh socialization but he's overcome yeah by the by By the the violence the brutes the world is too chaotic even even for the most the, the 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 most esteemed concierge i love when he's like complimenting people i love when that guy he, he's like walking through the prison with that cart of food and he's like offering people food and he's like it needs a little bit of salt but it's actually pretty del- delightful and he, <laughs> he gives it to that really tall guy just like with a scar on his face and then later on when that guy's narking them out yelling when they're trying to escape guards the guy that guy yeah. yelling happens to be the roommate of the guy he served breakfast to earlier and mm-hmm. the guy just like chokes him out so or, good. and then he's like you're such a kind <laughs> kind beautiful man <laughs> Thank you for killing that guy. You know, that just occurred to me that that's kind of an interesting parallel where at first um, he's going around with the food as you were describing and, you know, the, the, the tall guy comes up to him and he would be really intimidating and like a lesser man maybe would be like, ah, geez, no, I'm getting out of here. But he just stands his ground and he's like, hey, put some salt in it, try it out. And the guy likes it. And later that the fact that he was kind to that person comes back to help him. But with the train scene, it's almost the opposite. Well, okay, he wasn't kind to the policeman, but he recognizes Henkels. He's like, oh, I know you. You're little Albert or whatever. And there's some sophisticated, there's some civilization there. But later when they get stopped in the train again, it doesn't help him. He's got the little card that was given to him. by, And he says, oh, see, this is a piece of kindness that was extended to me. And now I'm going to, that's going to save me, but it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's huh. like a civility begets civility. He, like, yeah. Especially inmates, like people in jail, a lot of those people are just they live their lives without ever getting the smallest kindnesses offered to them. Mm. Like you get profiled and people just treat you differently immediately when they just first see you. So when someone just extends an olive branch like that, it's like, great. Thank you very much. Right. He gives, he gave me a chance. It's, it's mutual trust. I choose to trust you for a second. And hopefully in the future you choose to trust me. I love that his kindness gets him in with the hardest group in the prison and they help him escape. (laughs) That scene with Harvey Keitel (laughs) It's so weird how he's just like flexing a muscle at a time as yeah. he's talking. He's just like, yeah, we're going to do this thing. And I was he's just so flexing confused. his pecs and then his biceps. Yeah. Like, I feel, I was trying to figure out like how intentional that scene was. I thought maybe like, he, maybe he delivered that scene and you could see some of his muscles flexing just in his deliverance of it. Because that could be completely yeah. normal. That could be happening to yeah. any of us right now, but we're not topless. My muscles are flexing uh, all of their own accord right Bro, now. I'm hard enough to hunt with right now. <laughs> oh. And then so maybe they saw, like, they just saw that happening. And then Wes was like, 
Can you actually just ramp that up? I like Maybe. that. I like yeah, that yeah. a lot. Accentuate it. Such a funny little cameo for Harvey Keitel. I don't know, but it was perfect. Two podcasts in a row with Harvey Keitel. Oh. By the way, Pulp too fiction. many. I don't like him now. Nah, he, <laughs> so in typical Wes Anderson fashion, everyone he's ever worked with is now in this movie. He's just like accruing a bigger oh list gosh. of Pokemon <laughs> that he can now <laughs> add into his movie. Yeah. And every cameo in this movie works for me, except for Owen Wilson. Mm. Owen Wilson's the only one that just pulls me out of the movie a little bit. There's like this magic veil, and when I hear his voice, I'm like, "Wow!" I just everyone else, I everyone the else, yours. wow. Yeah, every other actor is kind of like can can do classy when they want, but Owen Wilson can't really do classy. Well, there's that sequence, the Society of the Cross Keys, and it's a very quick montage of like, "Oh, we're calling this concert who's gonna like keep the chain going," and they show the basically the equivalent of Gustav at a bunch of different hotels, and they have yeah. their equivalent of zero, and it's like take over for me and like he goes and eats the thing or take over for me he's giving cpr and like the, the assistant has yeah, to they, come do the cpr yeah they demonstrate how important it is like there's like you're giving cpr to a guy you might die but like upholding the covenant of the cross <laughs> yeah. keys takes precedent over so all good. more important and all of those bits cuz those are all famous actors yeah you've got all work for me you've got bill murray in there you've got um bob baladan balaban that guy yeah man you could like play a drinking game or, or some kind of like weird Wes Anderson bingo with his cast of characters. <laughs> like I have, I have them all down here. There are like 12 actors who have been in at least three of his movies. Like Owen Wilson's been in seven. Yeah. Since the beginning. Oh he, my God. Yeah. I, apparently he co-wrote like Bottle the first Rocket. three, the yeah. first three first movies. Three. Wow. He co-wrote Bottle Rocket and Rushmore and the Royal Tenenbaums. Wow. And, Owen Wilson and, co-wrote those? Yeah. And, and Bottle Rocket was his first acting credit ever. So actually Owen Wilson and Wes Anderson's careers like launched each other's that's really cool what was what was the early one with the jason Schwartzman as the rushmore play? rushmore yeah, yeah yeah i liked that one that one's really good that i like it better fun. than bottle rocket bottle rocket's good but i never saw bottle rocket what about tilda swinton though she's in three of these of his movies yeah she i think they won an oscar for makeup based on making her look like an octogenarian at the beginning of she movie. she it's... looked so real in this one yeah she actually looked like she works for me in this Okay, but also she works for me. I hired she her. looks a lot like Kate Blanchett. Sort of. Like, can't you picture her as Galadriel? Oh, totally. But Kate Blanchett's like a beautiful woman, and Tilda Swinton's like a striking, interesting looking person. But I would never call her a beautiful. woman. I don't think they look alike at all. What are you talking, dude? About, I'm not dude? the only one. If you I'd, if you Google like, uh, I would Tilda Swinton versus the letter C, like it'll autocomplete. I I would put them in like the same category of like stately British actresses. But uh, she could play Galadriel for sure, but I don't think they look alike. <laughs> Get I feel out like of here. Kate Blanche is like a softer version. Like her nose is just a little wider and less. I just sharp. feel like their facial ex- structures are completely different. I will, I will die on this hill. Well, whatever, man. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum, though, I love Kovacs, Deputy Kovacs. I like that character a lot. It's cool because he's basically like exposition dump in this movie. He right. just is like, I'm executing the uh, the will. And like, mm-hmm. I'm just telling you what's going on. But they found a cool way to do it by making it come from a quirky character who doesn't take like sentence breaks. Right. He just says it in a really cool and concise way, but like, forcing you to pay attention and lean in. I am constantly impressed in this movie how long some of the monologues are. Like where there's, where there's like, it's one shot and it's, and it's, maybe it's only a few sentences, but maybe it's only a few sentences, but the sentences are chock full of these like archaic long words big words and they just like deliver the whole thing in one take and it's like and, and as an actor you know i'm having to memorize lines it's it's a little frustrating sometimes it's hard and not only that but like if you think of the scene where uh gustav is interviewing the lobby boy he mm. he's doing a huge monologue like that but he's also hitting all these beats like yeah. all these people are coming up to him and he has to tell them come back later and uh, this i don't know this paint is too red or whatever right, it may right. be that's a crazy. That's crazy. They yeah. probably shot that. It probably took forever. Ray Fines kills it. He, uh, I, I saw an interview where, you know, in the in the movie, he is the mentor of Zero, the lobby boy, and uh, apparently on set and during the production of this movie, he kind of like fulfilled that role to Tony Revolori, and he kind of fulfilled that role to him as well because hmm. that was one of his. Uh, uh, first movies or whatever. That guy's now Flash in the Spider-Man movies. Good, oh, no way. Good yeah. for him. He's not the Flash. No. Just Flash. He's Flash Thompson or whatever his name is. He's Spider-Man's bully. Yeah. If you're going to be in a movie, be in Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy with that. Were you guys confused by the tone at all? Because 
it does have that storybook quality. So you're kind of removed from it a little more, but I think it still kind of like confuses me a bit when the whole movie's funny, it's snappy, it's it's kind of like uh, fairy tale-y, and then the scene where Jopling, Willem Dafoe's character, is like stalking uh, Kovacs, Jeff Goldblum's character, and he like follows him to the museum, and it's like this like kind of it's a scary chase scene, and at the end he, he loses his fingers and then dies, and I'm just like, whoa, this is now dark. Like it wasn't that dark before. I don't find that particularly dark, and it didn't. That totally f- vibes for me, where it's like a kind of a classic uh, detective chase, where he's like, "Oh, there's a person after me." And, he's and they're in a the museum, museum, so they have all these sarcophagi. And yeah, stuff. I That's think cool. the, the right. thematic or the the moment that I feel like doesn't gel with the tone is when they're escaping the prison, uh, and they open the the floorboard, and there's the room of, of guards, and the one guy of the group has to go in and kill everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the last shot is just everyone dead, and him and the prison guard stabbing each other. Right. And I was like, whoa, that's yeah, that's dark. But that's kind of what I'm talking. Like that's that's the same. That I mean, maybe you didn't feel it the first time, but that's like the same thing for me where. We're in this kind of like, ooh, we're escaping. It's a caper. Yeah, da, da. And then it's like, oh, nope. Somebody gets stabbed and dies. Well, I mean. He saves them in the process. But but it happens twice. You guys have had two examples just now. So maybe it felt jarring both times. But like if it does it enough, that's just, that's the movie you're watching, up, right? I guess no, it's, no, for sure. It's, it's set, set up, up. He throws for, a cat off the roof. Yeah. and it's <laughs> But it's also, it's the setup for kind of the that's emotional moment. climax of uh, Ray Fiend's character being killed, and like right. they have to kind of give you those gravitas moments where you you know that this world there is death yeah. and violence, so that you accept that that will happen. It's a funny, quirky caper, but then you you are reminded that this is inspired by the Nazis yeah. slowly taking control of Europe. Not everybody can just drop from a, a building and smash through the top of a truck and land in a pile of empty Mendel's boxes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly, and that's what's. I think that's. That's part of the charm of Wes Anderson's movies that someone jumps off a building and they might just be totally fine in this kind of like cartoon style of rescue or they might splatter into a million pieces on the pavement. You never know. Best quote from this movie, shaking like a shitting dog. (laughs) I think of that quote all the time. Yeah. All the time. It's just like part of my repertoire now. Yeah. After seeing the movie once like six years ago. It's 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 uh, one of the most reliable uh, things that Gustav does in this movie that that I just love. Similes. Well, yeah, love similes. <laughs> no, like he'll just be like so poised, and like I told, like I talked about earlier, and then all of a sudden he'll just like drop an f bomb or something, and it'll just be like, that's that's his character. Gunter was slain in the catacombs. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching this movie. I was like, this is Riley's kind of movie. I loved it. Right? I loved it. <laughs> this is exactly like Riley <clears throat> aesthetic and humor. Like if yeah. I picture myself, like uh, I don't know what. There's an episode of Darkwing Duck. Do you guys ever <laughs> watch that show in the 90s? Basically the same oh, yeah. as this movie. There's an episode of Darkwing Duck where they like jump into a painting. They jump in various paintings and they're in like a Picasso and it's all like Cubist and stuff. What? And if, if I jump into like Riley's mind or like I'm in his dream, it's a Wes Anderson stylized Oh, that's dream. so funny. No. I don't think so. <laughs> you don't dream in, in well, Wes Anderson? The funny thing is that I have a friend who I would imagine is like that. My, my friend Brandon... Shout out to you if you're listening. <laughs> yeah, Brandon. <laughs> up, Brandon? He loves Wes Anderson. We've actually done a bunch of uh, short films done in the style of Wes Anderson that we like submitted to festivals and stuff. The Pants Society. Look it up. <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh man, in his mind, that's that's what he that's what his mind looks like. Hundred percent stylized in this way. I think for me, it would be like Star Wars. It'd just be Star Wars <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> Spaceships, lightsabers. I like the way people move in his movies. Nobody mm. moves like a normal person. They all like run with their backs and arms really straight or like <laughs> like yeah, I think that's honestly that that the the scene where he just runs away from the police that really struck me there cuz they're they're all kind of running in this sort of like arms close to your body sort of like remaining upright your legs are kind of like goofily like are they told to do that or does one person take the lead and the rest emulate it like I don't know in but... any one of his movies like if someone's hanging like they're going to fall yeah. just the way that they hold their arms yeah. and look up like it's very cartoonish. It's it's as if they have been drawn by sort of like a you know a quaint, yeah, a it's, quaint. Author. Maybe they do. Do you know? Do they storyboard his movies a lot? And I'm sure they do. They I do don't know. Like share them at table reads or something. I'm the sure way that everything not. is so meticulously done, they have to storyboard. I mean, they they must. I want to talk a little bit about the style of this movie because I think that's a really important part to the equation of why it's as good as it is. Is right. the way it looks. And we talked briefly about the aspect ratio. I talked a little bit about the colors changing as we go through, but. Even within the lowest level of the dream, 
Um, the dream. <laughs> like I said, Inception for storytellers. Uh, the color is changing. And so, Lowest level as in the 30s? The 30s, okay. yeah. Step back out to the third level, which is the Jude Law version of the author getting the story from the old man of Zero Mustafa. And it's, it's all warm colors, orange. Uh, it's the same hotel, but they've built in these walls. So it's the exact same set, which is a department store they found in the middle of Eastern Europe. Uh, and they first built the proper beautiful pink version of the Grand Budapest Hotel, and then they built the second set on top of it. Oh, wow. Uh, and so they shot that part first, they dismantled that, and then did the next part. Um, and so that part's like kind of yellow-orange, but then we go to the pink. And that's when I think Wes Anderson does this kind of seasonal color thing within the 30s, where it starts in the Budapest Hotel. It's like kind of pink, purple, kind of rose colors, very springtime. Right. So we get to Madame D's house, and it's all green and wood. It's kind of like summery. Uh, and then there's actually, it skips autumn, goes right to winter. There's prison. There's the actual winter sequence where they're chasing surge and it's all the snow stuff. Mm. Uh, and within the prison, it starts with a cold white. Uh, but then when he makes friends, it becomes a warm white. And so it's kind of evolving there. Mm. But then to kind of symbolize this hotel that was once in its prime, once in its springtime, it becomes orange. And that's what it is in the 60s. It's it's, it's autumnal co- colors. Man. And so I love the colors, not just like changing per level, it's evolving with the characters with the story and it it just it just moves man i love i love that i i can appreciate all that and at the same time it didn't it didn't like pull me out of it or anything it smack you in the face it feels yeah. so so natural totally um and i think that speaks to wes anderson's ability to kind of just take all of these influences and just put them into the movie like he says that he traveled around eastern europe trying to like get a feel for you know, for the 60s era, he, he went to all these, like, kind of Soviet-era hotels and, and architectural centers, and it was just like, oh, okay, that's what the aesthetic was. And so, like, the whole movie is just infused with that that realisticness. Yeah, yeah. that little town is a real little town yep. by the yeah. border of, like, Poland and Germany. Gerlitz. It's, half of it is in Germany, and half of it is in Poland. Another well, thing, that aspect ratio thing, the fact that it's four by three, also lends... To the aesthetic of the movie because it's a more vertical aspect ratio you get more ceilings you get more like right. rooftops and stuff and that kind of you know like i figure i feel like if i was drawing a wes anderson character they would be thin and tall like they'd have long <laughs> legs they'd have like a, they'd have a top hat or something yeah. like that the characters and the buildings the, the budapest hotel itself have those proportions right and so many of his shots in this movie are kind of like removed far back from where someone else would shoot it like we are just we, like if we're looking into a room, we're basically like, I mean, if we're in a room like this size, you can't see if you're not watching the video. But if you're in like a medium sized room, the camera's basically like on the wall and like low down. So so you're kind of getting this like symmetrical, not only symmetrical horizontally, but symmetrical horizontal or uh, vertically view. You're just like in the center of everything that I'm thinking of that first scene where we first meet uh, Monsieur Gustave and he's starts on the left side of the room and kind of walks over and then the the camera is tracking with him that whole time and I'm like envisioning the camera just like in the center of the wall cuz we're basic we're almost at waist height just like looking at things center like that so you get you see the feet you see the head you see some of the ceiling and it's just like you're looking into this little diorama that someone has made it's uh it's beautiful what makes me sad a little bit watching this movie is that there's no 4k hdr version there's a criterion collection version though so the criterion is still 1080p blu-ray mastered in 2k uh and it's not an hdr and so it's better than what you can get throw it out or not (laughs) it's not even worth it at that point uh (laughs) no i'm sure it's why does that not exist though uh i'm not sure so it's it's shot on film and so so because it's shot on film like the resolution is kind of infinite right Sort of. I mean, you potentially could scan it and denoise and do all these things, but like realistically, it's somewhere around 4K on most 35 stocks. Um, 35 meaning like they, it was shot on 35 millimeter, millimeter film. Yes. Right. Oh, okay, so that's why when things are shot like like uh, 2001 Space Odyssey was shot on 70 millimeter yeah. film, and they can remaster that up to 8K, which they've Easily, done. Easily, yeah. yeah. And so that I think this movie is more than deserving of a 4K remaster. Hashtag 4K Budapest. I think it's <laughs> it's a hashtag. We're starting a revolution. Start it up. Come on, Mr. Anderson. Come on, man. Mr. Anderson. The people have spoken. Yeah. Because I, I feel like even like a little bit more color. There's sometimes when uh, there's a dark background and some things just get kind of lost. Is and there I, an HDR? No, there's not there's, an HDR. You got to get an HDR. Mix. Uh, yeah. I just wish there was like uh, a little more in the backgrounds, a little more depth. 
Uh, and I think this movie is so gorgeous that it doesn't matter. Like it's still so such a feast for the eyes, mm-hmm. even in this lower quality version. But man, this movie would pop. Man, I want to see this like wide color gamut HDR, like I, because he's an intentional director. I want to know what his intent was. I want to know yeah. what colors he wanted me to yeah. see. I think I think you guys are kind of missing out on on the full experience. If you really want to check it out, you should watch it on a laptop. Really, <laughs> seventeen inch laptop. Now that's. <laughs> Now that's the theater. Yeah, I'm for really, me. What I really want to watch. I'm really glad I have this glass because yeah. Dave almost just spat at me. <laughs> what I really want is a 35 mil screening of this. And there's not that many movies where I'm like, I want to go to a theater and like actually have a 35 mil projector. I want to have some charcuterie and a cheese plate. <laughs> yeah. um, oh my gosh! Have, uh, what a wasted stuff. opportunity. I want how a hot I, toddy. How did I not watch this movie with a plate of charcuterie Ugh, so and good. a glass of wine? I wanted to name one of the wines that they say in this movie, but I can't think of it. I'm not classy enough. Not civilized. Have you ever had a hot toddy? I wish. <laughs> Sounds like a sex movie. Don't know what that is. It's, it's oh. a warm alcoholic drink. Oh, oh I've had mulled wine. Uh, of course you have. Have you had that? Yes. It's a German, German drink for Christmas. I'm also for one Christmas of the time. Germans. I love ah. that. At the Christmas market. So nice. Guys, I had a question. So in the dining room in the 60s, there's this big painting in the background. What is that painting? Wait, when which uh, one? Which which dining room? And the so in the hotel when Mustafa is telling the story to Jude Law's version of the author, there's the oh, big yeah. dining room and there's just this big kind of landscape painting with a deer. Right. Uh that's huge. What's the like there must be a significance to what was that what that painting is, but I couldn't quite figure it out. What do you guys think that Did you painting look it up? is? No, I didn't. Did I you could. feed the painting into an AI um, reverse you know, number when I, when cruncher? When I was searching for it, everything was like, what's the significance of boy with apple? And I was like, mm. there is none. <laughs> is <laughs> it like, a real painting? It's not a real painting. It was commissioned for the movie. <laughs> I love the one that they <laughs> they replace it with. It's so oh. perfect. <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, that's such a great... Uh, it's like two nude women yeah. like, spread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a great moment of physical comedy where it's like the uh, just complete sophistication. And that the the portrait that they put in its place is a different aspect ratio so you yeah. can still see <laughs> yeah. the, sh- the shadow yeah. of the previous painting. Adrian Brody okay we didn't really talk about him at all but we're, we're running out of time here but Adrian Brody I love him in this movie he's probably my favorite actor that shows up the least in this movie I just love how he he's basically he's basically just a bro like he's he's got this k- kooky mustache but he's like I'm gonna freaking kill you like <laughs> and he talks basically like a modern day person uh, the one thing that I wanted, I, I, that is a huge thing that I love in this movie, is the, is when the characters kind of break character and talk as if they're from present day for a second. Like when uh, when uh, Gustave goes and sees the body of Madame D, he's like, you're looking so well, darling, you really are. I don't know what sort of cream they put on you down at the morgue, but I want some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like, no one would say that in the 30s. It's, it's, it was just, it's so perfect. And when, when Adrian Brody comes up and he's just like, I'm going to blast your candy ass to like, no, come on. It's just, uh, I love it. I, you can almost like sympathize with him, even though he's like a caricature and he just looks like an evil guy. You're kind of like, yeah, who is this Gustav asshole? Yeah. He's like having sex with all these 80 year old ladies. <laughs> like, is he actually just trying to get on the will for all these chicks? He doesn't Maybe. love them. I think he yeah. shows tenderness to them, but you know he says, "I'm not going to fucking Lutz." Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> when he, she's like, "I love you," and he's like, "I and I love you," Chanel, like, and he just gets <laughs> yeah, the yeah. chariot to leave. I think, yeah, I think that it makes sense for his character. You know, like I, said I don't chariot, know. but I meant car or carriage. I th- <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for correcting yourself. I think that his character maybe wouldn't feel that close to. I don't know if his character would feel true love for any person because he reserves that love for the hotel and the the, the sophistication you know that's who he's married to and Duty. these people are all just kind of like extensions of that so he he treats them with respect and care but he never really like is going to actually fall in love with any of them but i think like to him that's as good as it's going to get and like i think he does genuinely he says that love them he says you get what you get yeah and i, right. I don't think he's like a cynical man no I think he's like that's just his expression of what love looks like for for him in this point of his life. Right, right, right. But I, what I'm saying is that, you know, he, he'll he be like, and I love you. But he doesn't love them in the big L word. Like, he loves but them as But he's not a, strictly lying either. No, he's not lying. He, they're, they're his friends. And he cares about them. But he's not like, I'm sure that they they all love him more than he loves them. He would never say I he, like He you. doesn't have an right. Agatha. Right, exactly. And his Agatha is the hotel. And can we talk about how 
excellent the ending of this movie is, how friggin' bittersweet this motherfucker is. <laughs> 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 Tell us, David. Man, it gives you everything you want. Like they they get not just like the painting, but they get the entire inheritance because of the murder clause and this alternate uh, will. Gustav gets everything, and then Mustafa gets everything. You're like, that's great. But Agatha dies two years later. You get this scene of like their marriage, and it's beautiful and all this. Yeah. And from the retelling, you never see her dying, but you hear a couple years later she died from some widespread disease. Well, he only says like three words about it, or six yeah. words about it, and then he gives three sentences to how Gustav died. And it's because like he can tell this big elaborate story, but when it comes to things that are actually close to him, the things that really matter, that's just too painful him for him to recall. I think that I think that the the melancholy aspects of the of the ending, where you know Gustav dies, uh, Agatha dies, uh, the hotel falls into disrepair. I think that all kind of is is thematically consistent with the idea that the world is chaotic and and uh, you know everything falls, every everything dies eventually. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to. To, to to be civilized, to put a nice bow on things, to make the Mendels to create cakes. order in a universe that tends towards exactly. entropy. Exactly, and this is the same th- meaning that I found in Pulp Fiction. So maybe this is maybe this is more me <laughs> is than this the movie. Post modern movie. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe this is more me than the movie. But I think it's I think I'm justified here. Yeah. I think that's definitely a theme because you know you can see it's in the 30s. We have the, we, everything is shiny and and pink and and blushy and rosy, and we go to the modern day and it's it's cold and we're in a graveyard and. And that's the progression, right? And I think it's just like, hey, people die. You can you can find your love and have her for two years and have a two year old son or whatever. Oh no, the the son died too. Yeah, yeah. Have her have a have a family and enjoy it for for enjoy what you have while you have it because it's not going to be here for long. And even if you still have it, it won't be the same. Right. Exactly. Just like this podcast. Dang. What are we doing next week, guys? I think we want to do some mind benders. Some mind benders we've been, the, we've the had popular s- 2004 <laughs> to kids animated tv show Ooh. where they go into people's heads oh. and they all have different superpowers That's and cool. inside riley's head it looks like a west anderson <laughs> movie no no it's probably some like desolate wasteland <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's the sith planet Hexagon. <laughs> yeah oh. <laughs> Yeah, we want to do a mind better. I think we're going to throw up on the poll something like Mr. Nobody, The Fountain, which is what I really want to do. Ooh. Uh, what else was Tree on Tree of Life. Tree of Life. And the fourth one, we don't know. We don't know yet. We'll find it. Man, we should do ones that I haven't seen. You've on- seen all those? Only that I haven't seen. I've seen The Fountain. What was the other one you said? Tree Mr. of no- Life. Seen that one. Mr. Nobody. I haven't seen that. Jeremy What's Lee. that? Don't watch the director's cut. Too long. Yeah. No, we're watching the theater. Well, it's going to be up to a poll anyways, I guess. Or no, not this week. Are we alternating the polls? What are we doing? We're doing a poll. Listeners, tell us. <laughs> yeah. I, we'll everyone do tweet at us, don't do a poll. I want no choice. Make <laughs> we'll, an executive decision. We'll put a poll up, and you can decide whether we do a poll or not. All right. It'll be yeah. a meta poll. Meta poll. Postmodern poll. You can see that poll <laughs> at Carpool <laughs> Critics Twitter. You can email us your suggestions. And let's accept that Matt guy. Three emails, dude. <laughs> Three emails oh, asking no. us to do the Invisible Man. I replied to every th- all three of those emails. Wow, he's getting a shout out. <laughs> Matt, if you email me asking for that Invisible Man one more time, I swear to God. Are we ever going to do the Invisible Man? Maybe. No. I saw the trailer. looked okay. Anyway. It looked horrible, but apparently it was all right. He emails us at carpoolcriticspodcast at gmail.com. Love you, Matt. Oh, and keep hitting us up for the, uh, the mailbag, your questions that you got. You know? What color is Riley's... We're flooring. Oh, that's a good question. He's a homeowner. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. But yeah, and also your criticism is good too. Um, more criticism, please. We want to get better. Um, please be very specific. One person emailed in saying your podcast is too podcasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I get point taken though. Because we're doing a mailbag episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we answer questions. Yeah. When are we doing that? I don't know. When we have enough questions. Right now we only have like okay ten. So there you go. Send us in more questions, and we'll get to the mailbag episode quicker. 